So what is an FTD squeeze? <laughs> well, this is a new concept and I really like the concept. I like the information that's presented in this document. So I was asked to take a look at this document and give some thoughts. And um, this document is the first time that I've ever heard of the concept of an S, sorry, not an STD squeeze, ah, an F, whew, an FTD squeeze. What is an FTD squeeze? And I find this argument compelling. I find this document to be full of, of really good content, and I want to share those things with you. But the first thing I want to do is summarize, just give a TLDR of the difference between a short squeeze, a gamma squeeze, and then this new concept, which I mean, I Googled it, I had never seen seen I, I i didn't see anything older than a few days as far as this this new concept called an ftd squeeze and i do think that it is something worth keeping in mind that this is a thing and it's a thing that we tend to think of in the context of short squeezes but it's actually its own thing so if you know what a gamma squeeze is let me i'll just define the the terms real quick real quick a gamma squeeze is when the price of a stock um, reaches a certain point where all of the options are, are are in the money. And so that causes this massive buying pressure from people who um, who so who sold calls that they need to buy shares to cover themselves. And so all of this buying pressure, it, it's like a missile that causes the price of the shares to shoot up like crazy. We saw this during the first um, GameStop run up to $480. We saw this happen several times. We saw it on the Friday before that big week when, if you remember when Robinhood and all those uh, brokers, they shut off uh, the, the purchasing of shares. Uh, we saw that on that Friday when it shot up very quickly from $60 a share which was the highest priced option that week up to $75 and we saw it several times throughout that week and then what's a short squeeze a short squeeze is basically when a short a shorter a, a hedge fund who decided to short a company unexpectedly that 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 stock increases in price and they just decide you know what I'm gonna throw in the towel and so what is the difference between an FTD squeeze and a short squeeze? Here's the best way I can put it. A short squeeze is when the company decides to throw in the towel. An FTD squeeze is when the company is forced to throw in the towel. And I have no idea what the history of this has been like. I don't know of examples, maybe VW, but maybe not, that it, it, it's gotten to a point where not you're, you want to keep kicking the can down the road, but you are unable to do so anymore because of all of this massive pressure from uh, those above you who are calling for you to deliver the shares. And you've got to liquidate yourself and you're done. It's over. It's Armageddon. And so that's a, that's a good way to think about it. Again, short squeeze being you throw in the towel, FTD squeeze being they force you, you, you are forced, you have no choice to throw in the towel. Big difference between the two. I think all three of those elements are key in understanding why this GameStop squeeze is going to be the MOAS, you know, the mother of all short squeezes. So again, I was asked to check out this document. I thought it was very well organized. I thought it skipped a little bit. It got a little jumpy, but you know, I'm not going to um, complain too much. I really, I really liked what I saw in this document. So let's take a look at things briefly. Well, it, it might not be all that brief to be honest with you, but I think this is really important. So I hope you can bear with me throughout it. So, you know, the first few pages here, just got to get behind. I, I don't even want to read this. You, you know, it's all the legal stuff, all the disclaimers and everything. We don't really need to cover that stuff. But while, while I'm scrolling through here, I will tell you this video is for entertainment purposes only. So please do your own research before investing your hard earned money. So if you know anything about short selling, this covers it here. Very, very basic stuff, especially if you've been in GameStop since January or since before then. I don't, I don't think any of this stuff would be new to you. I do like the, the concept here, this bankruptcy jackpot. This is your goal when you're shorting a stock is that you want the bank, you want the company to go bankrupt. You want the stock to go to zero so that all that money that you borrowed, you essentially don't have to give back. And that is the intention with every head 
hedge fund, when they short a stock, they expect it to go bankrupt. And, you know, lots of success there. Uh, you, I'm sure you can think of plenty over the time, over time, Borders, um, whoever else, Circuit City, um, Enron. Enron was a phenomenal opportunity for a short squeeze, especially because, or not for a short squeeze, but for a, a bankruptcy, a, a bankruptcy jackpot, uh, especially because they were they were lying, and that is a company that did not deserve to exist anymore. So I could go on with that, but it, you know, I'd recommend just checking out the the document if you're looking for introductory stuff. I don't feel a need to cover those things. So why GameStop? Why was GameStop targeted as a short squeeze candidate? I, I think that's pretty self-explanatory, right? We have this brick and mortar world where um, where that was tradition. That was what that was the, the status quo for so long. And then the internet came and was a disruptor. And GameStop operated in many ways like a lot of dying companies would. They just they kept on borrowing money. You know, they they kept on um, taking out loans and, and kicking the can down the road and not paying back <clears throat> back those loans. And so it's not like these hedge funds. You've got to give Melvin, you got to give all these other hedge funds some credit here by all means up until probably August of 2020, it looked like GameStop was just dead in the water. You know, it looked like this was a no-brainer for a company that was going to die. And that that's what all this document is explaining for the uh, several for these several pages here is that GameStop was dying. It was over. And so why not short GameStop? Um so let's let's move on here. I'm trying to think if there's anything that it, it it's just these first few pages here are explaining why GameStop was essentially it was pretty much a crappy company and not not cr a crappy company. I love GameStop. Um, I love their niche, if you will. But um, by all means, that it, it just looked like, especially with COVID, that GameStop was going to die. That they lost a lot of money uh, when COVID kicked in, and they it, at a time that they couldn't afford to. So time for a game. What would you do? Let's assume there's a company which has always had a brick and mortar footprint, but is currently in a quickly growing technology world dominated by digital sales, home delivery, and first party distribution. Their financial model has always been running against debt to generate liquidity. In 1.5 years, they take on 825,000. I don't think it's thousand. I think that's a mistake. Plus interest. Uh, their year-over-year -year earnings have been flat or following inflation trends, but they are reporting the same debt on yearly earnings reports, and you already have a short position in this company and have already found profit, profit from its instability. So it's a no-brainer. I mean, honestly, it was a no-brainer for companies, for hedge funds like Melvin to get in and short this company. By, by every metric that you could see, GameStop was worth shorting. Now, there was a, a problem, not, not, a, not really that much of a problem, but there were some failure to deliverers here throughout the last year and a half before August again. There were failures to deliver, but there was an easy solution to that. You just shorted more shares and you took those shares that you, you know, quote, sold and turned them in to, uh, to you know, get them delivered. So it wasn't a big deal at the time. Now it is an enormous deal. So let's move on. Ratings matter. This is kind of a, it's a mildly important page here, but um, the ratings that GameStop got were poor. It's just that, that you know, they, they kept on getting downgraded. That's all this page is saying. And so another reason why, um, you know, for creditors, for GameStop borrowing, their borrowing costs increase, etc. And so things are going on. So Q4 2019 to Q3 2020, a 12 month period here. The above chart provides a visualization of fail to deliver the blue lines here, uh, volume, the red, which is very little, and price changes over time, the green, which for that year was pretty flat until the end of the year, you can see that spike in the price, which was pretty unexpected. And then the chart's primary purpose, let me move back up again, I'm sorry about that. The chart's primary purpose is to provide a, a cited timeline of data points which impact the long-term viability of and credit rating of GameStop as a company, while also noting the correlation of these public announcements with spikes in fail to deliver shares. Multiple credit rating downgrades are followed immediately by volume and fail to deliver spikes with increased short selling. Uh, the share price has now dropped to an all-time low of $3.50 a share. Available shares and float are relatively low because... Um, 
you know, as shorts increase, so does buying pressure, but average Joes are not buying GameStop. I mean, put yourself a year ago. Would you have bought shares in GameStop knowing all of this stuff? I, I think it would have been a no-brainer that you wouldn't have. Maybe the, the thing you would have done is you would have bought some puts um, and bet against it in your own way. Immediately following the private offer announcement that failed to deliver volume spike, we can also see price moving up with increased buying pressure as share availability decreases. So in other words, they, they got a little greedy. They, um, they shorted it beyond how it could be shorted, which was a cause for these fail, fail to delivers, which made them want to short even more and get to a point where we were over 100% shorted. So anyway, what is a float? Why does it matter? This is, there's a lot of stuff here. The, the biggest pieces of this pie that are worth noting, noting are Fidelity Puritan Trust, which is, uh, let me just say that that's a symbol for mutual funds and for retirement. That is, and let's just, let me just say that so you know that a lot of shares that are in existence, I think it's something like, all right, 69.75 million shares of GameStop are in existence, and you do yourself a disservice in thinking about that as the total float because a lot of these shares that are that are tied up in mutual funds they are either not there's no very little chance that those shares are going to be sold or there is a zero percent chance that those shares are going to be sold depending on the mutual fund and so a lot of this stuff is locked up every Every piece of the pie here that you see aside from this pink section is locked up and then you see Ryan Cohen, this dark blue part, section here. We'll talk about that in, in a second. So it's very important to remember the remaining float is really what matters here. Okay, so next page. This means uh, removing mutual funds which are unable to sell short and insiders who are unwilling to sell short. The approx approximate remaining float with a 5% error is prior to August 2020, 27.9 million shares. And so you see stuff about short float, you see all this stuff, you need to keep in mind, we're not talking about 69.75 million shares, we're talking about 27.9 million shares. This means that the highest number of available shares to be shorted at any given time should, keyword should, be 27.9 million. We know from reported short volume that GME has been over shorted for years, but 27.9 million shares is a good amount of room for short sellers to move in order. They can move in and out in order to continue making a profit and val in driving the share value down. Then this is where it gets fun. The unthinkable happens. What's the unthinkable? Ryan Cohen a man who we all know and love at this point, the former CEO of Chewy, he buys 9 million shares of GME. Joining the board as a 12.9% owner, his venture firm, RC Ventures, has committed to providing GME capital for outstanding debt. So in essence, his, his purchase cuts away 32% of the float. And so now there are only 19.3 million available shares. To float and now and, and so then this the the noose is tightening for these short sellers so this is where it gets complicated um let me see here i i read through this twice and so i don't want to miss anything um, now it gets complicated. I know what you're thinking now. It is important to note prior to this point, the data provided was deeply rooted in verifiable facts, numbers, and sources. Everything from the above is complete you, these are things you can um, you can look up everything below is just this is where why our GME exists this is why Wall Street bets exists because we're looking at these numbers and we're thinking hold on a second all right 19 something million shares logically this is where things should progress from so moving on in this document and this is the important stuff this is where logically things should go and so available float, share price, et cetera. Um, if you want to take a look at this stuff, please do so. I will, I, I'll, I'll for sure, I'll put a link to this in the description of the video so you can check it out. So continue, continuing our game. Last we left our game on slide six, we were deciding what we would do if handed a proverbial cash cow by shorting GME for four plus years. I would, I would absolutely short GME up until Ryan Cohen bought 
GameStop, you know, bought all those shares of GameStop, it made logical sense to short GME. And, and this is the recap. You know, all of that stuff that we were, we've been talking about, all of the, the credit ratings, the loss of, of revenue because of COVID, everything, everything was going in, in ga against GameStop um, in, in the favor of the hedge funds. It just, it made perfect sense. But then Ryan Cohen bought in and that caused a few things to happen. But even before that, I mean, I know DFV was talking about this stuff long before Ryan Cohen bought in, but that was a sort of catalyst. So the FTD squeeze, why this squeeze is not the VW squeeze, a gamma squeeze, or any other squeeze that has been squoze. In, in other words, why there's no, there's no such thing. If you Google it, you're not going to find anything about a fail to deliver squeeze up until very recently. So did you, like the shorters, choose to bank on the imminent failure of GME and realize that more the more open shorts you had for GME, naked or not, would mean more money for you when the retailer finally fell? If so, then I suppose your next question is, what about those pesky fail-to-deliverers? Have I got a plan for you? The timeline below, we'll take a look at that, shows the FTD report dates from the US SEC. This report tells everyone just how many FTDs were floating for a specific stock. You can only carry a short share for two days before it is required to be reported to the SEC and add added to the list. I um, this is we're about to enter a territory where it's hard for me to explain. It's basically the process of an FTD. Just know that the more FTDs there are, the bigger of a deal, the bigger of a problem this is for the hedge funds. It just it's like the noose tightening around the neck. But here's an example. This timeline here. You borrow one hundred shares from broker A and the, to sell them for $10 a share. You owe those 100 shares to broker A, so you go to broker B, borrow 100 shares, immediately giving them to broker A. This is the way they've been kicking the can down the road. You owe broker B 100 shares and the share price is $5 a share. Well, all right, this is this is how it, it should work for a, a short squeeze at least. You buy 100 shares at $5 each and give them to broker B. You now owe zero shares and you have made a profit of $500 by juggling some shares you never actually owed. What if we back up a step and imagine that you didn't buy in step three and instead borrowed from broker C to satisf satisfy broker B. Now imagine the 100 shares broker C gave you to cover your shares owed to broker B were borrowed shares that somebody else borrowed from broker A. Now imagine they were your shares. If you're thinking what's the big deal if GME is going to fail and the bankruptcy jackpot is inevitable, then what does it matter how long we kick the can down the road if shares are available to borrow just to continue borrowing, shorting, and profiting until uh, March 15th of 2021, AKA two days ago. So that's, a, that's an important point that I, I missed in, the, in an earlier section. There was something about March 15th as a day that a lot of these hedge funds identified as essentially the day that, that GameStop would go bankrupt. But then Ryan Cohen came in and provided all of this new liquidity and, and pretty much prevented that. And they were able to um, pay off their debts rather aggressively. And so this 315 doomsday scenario didn't happen. And... Um, Oh, well, too bad, too bad, so sad. So FTD squeeze continue. Now that we know the what, when, why, and how, let's look at the why not. For this, we need to understand a bit about risk models, a few things we should consider as truth. Banks, hedge funds are not dumb. They don't take risks, etc. They, they, this is giving Melvin credit, like I've said. They, they aren't stupid. This is what it should have looked like for them. Bank, uh, GameStop should have gone bankrupt. They should have made billions of dollars. And with that in mind, what are the risks here as of May 2020? Essentially non-existent pretty much non-existent because GameStop was a dying company. It should have died. COVID had just kicked in two months earlier in the United States. Things were just looking bleak for anything that required foot traffic, you know? And so made a lot of sense. But then GME pulls out a market changing win in nine months, which saves the company from certain bankruptcy. Chances of that were pretty low in May of 2020. 
an external investor steps in to dramatically cut the available shares we have to us, forcing us to fight against our own shorts and avoid FTDs. Again, very unlikely in May of 2020. And then three, the share price su suddenly starts spiking, pushing all our shorts out of the money as we now need to buy them at a higher ra uh, rate than we initially sold them. Very, very low chances of these things happening in May of 2020. But that's exactly what happened. All of those things happened. And so this is where it gets really, really complicated. The, the ideal, the expected time that you are sp supposed to be returning the share is T plus two, but it can extend to T plus 13. But as, let me summarize this section by saying, as those T plus 13 periods happen, which is not the ideal scenario, the time for um, these, the expectation for these shares to be delivered is tightening and tightening because, um, let me just go to it in a, in a second here. All right, because of this, I, sorry, it, it took me a second, but I found it here. Uh, Reg Show Rule 203B states that in the event FTDs are not resolved, the brokers are held responsible for their return. If after the full settlement period, they haven't been returned, the broker is prohibited from accepting a short sale order in any equity security or affecting a short sale order in any equity security for its own account until all FTDs have been located. Notably, this location requirement is satisfied if the broker is able to successfully, one, borrow the security, two, enter into a bona fide arrangement to borrow the security, or three, establish a reasonable grounds to believe that the security can be borrowed so that it can be delivered on the date the delivery is due. Put, put simply, the only way to clear the FTD short is to provide the actual share or short it again. And that is huge right there. So in other words, they have to buy a share or short it again. Those are their two options. At this point in time, because they like to win, because they're greedy, they have not been buying the actual shares. They have been shorting it again. They have been using creative means to short the shares, which we'll get to, but that is, that's their only option. And so there's an end game here. And we don't know when that end game is coming. We don't know how long they can kick the can down the road. But the end game is here. And if I were to describe how I feel right now, even with GameStop at a healthy price of $220 a share, I, I would describe me right now, for those of you who have seen The Big Short, who I would assume that's pretty much all of you, um, it's that time when... Um, when Bear Stearns is pretty much worth zero, and yet uh, those guys, the, the young guys, I can't remember their names, the ones who Brad Pitt is helping, um, they, they're still not getting any return because, uh, because Bear Stearns is pretty much lying to them. But, and so they're questioning, like, is this, is this happening? Is this short squeeze happening? Well, not for them. Is this big short happening? Are we going to get our money? And so there's that, there was that period where there was this tension. And I think we're living in that right now where this is inevitable and it should be coming soon, but like, we don't know when it's coming, but it's coming. All right. And I made, I think I, I would call it a mistake yesterday. I thought we were going to go back down to a hundred, maybe even less than a hundred. So I sold about a third of my shares and I regret that because it, it was one of the, it's one of these things where it's like, this is coming. I know it's coming. I don't know what the floor is. I know that the people in RGME are all like, you know, a million dollars is the floor, you know? And it's like, I want to believe I really do. It's just hard in the moment. And I'm sure at some point I'll be laughing at myself being like, can you believe that you actually doubted this? I'm sure. Whatever. Okay. So here's, I need to just skip this stuff. This stuff is not easy to explain, but let me get to the end game here. Here we go, Thanos. And so there's intense buying pressure. That buying pressure is going to just tighten and tighten for the hedge funds over time. And then in general, there are four potential outcomes here. A couple of these are just non-existent. Where is that? Oh, here we go. So these are the four potential outcomes. 
One, a bankruptcy jackpot. The spring breaks, the company goes under, tension is relieved. That's not happening. And whatever. A traditional short squeeze. The spring springs, all tension eventually is unable to be contained, and it releases, sending the long investors to the moon. Shorters experience large, typically sin- single incident losses, and the market stabilizes. Yeah, th- so that's traditionally what should happen, but this is an FTD squeeze. Again, remember from the v- beginning of the video, a short squeeze is Melvin or whoever else throwing in the towel. An FTD squeeze is basically the towel being thrown in for them they have no choice and so an FTD squeeze the spring springs several times the FTD cycle cycles share location requirements under a severely limited float and extraordinary extraordinarily high amounts of overshorted volume causing the springs tension to release in waves of lessening strength but at higher prices over an elongated period these multiple incident losses are necessary as the length of the squeeze and limited float require consistent additional tension to be applied throughout the slow release shorters experience larger multiple incident losses and the market stabilizes once the tension is returned turned to a manageable level given the reduced float and buying pressure. Um, and then number four, uncoiling the spring. This is this is also just, it's not a possibility here, but um, you, because there, there aren't, this is, all right, here we go. As more shares are made available, the tension will decrease proportionally and the market stabilizes once the tension is returned to a manageable level. So like the FTD squeeze, this requires a consistent additional tension to be applied throughout the slow release. However, it relies on the available float increasing, which, all right, think about this again. How many shares are available after Ryan Cohen made his purchase? And then you think about just Reddit. You don't even think about institutions, but like I have plenty of shares. I'm sure if you're watching this, you have plenty of shares. You think about how many millions of people are watching this and are in at some point. I mean, I have friends who have texted me and have bought shares, not many, but they've bought shares because, and so what is that doing as we're holding on to our shares? That is preventing scenario four from happening. And this is what's left, this FTD squeeze. And this is coming. It is coming. And I don't know what the bottom in, in this cycle looks like. I mean, we got down to $40 a share. And I my thought yesterday, at least, was that we were going to go down to maybe around $100 a share. And at that point, I would have been a very eager buyer. But it looks like that's not happening. And so upward movement over time, I don't know when. But there's another thing that we need to consider. And let me, let me take a look at a couple things here. First, we have Ehor. So GME short interest is 1.68 billion, 8.09 million shares shorted. That, when you think about 69.75 million shares, uh, which is what Ehor is is comparing that to, that doesn't seem very significant. But if you think about the, what was it, 18 million shares that are available um, before you, you consider retail and institutional investment in this, you consider the fact that DFV alone has 100,000 shares, that 8.9 million shares shorted is quite significant. But not only that, XRT, remember XRT, the ETF with GameStop shares in it that all of these short sellers essentially fled to, and now XRT's short is 100%, 140% of the float. XRT recently had 2 million fails to deliver. And so we can't just think of GameStop here. We got to think of XRT. You, if you want to look that up, go to, go to this website here. Um, SEC fails to deliver data. I'm not going to download the document. It's a, it's a zip form. I'm just not going to do that, but you can find it there. February 21, first half, second half, short data. And you will find that XRT's FTDs have skyrocketed. And why is that? Because they, they, the hedge funds got cute. They tried to, to mask their short interest, but the short interest is still very, very high. And so the moral of the story, don't be a paper hands like me yesterday, um, which I, I have no regrets. I'm sorry if that offends you. Um, I have no regrets, but um, it, it's, 
it's abundantly clear that this is happening, that it's coming. It's clear to me. And so we'll see. We'll see about the when, we'll see about the how, but this price is going higher. Let me see what else we have here. I mean, we talked about buying pressure. We talked about diamond hands. I mean, well, we didn't talk about diamond hands, but this is essentially the end of um, the end of this this uh, document here. So let me read this last part, and then I'll be done. Every news report, good or bad, every government hearing, every notable tweet is a catalyst that could push the buying pressure too high to maintain. Until then, you will slowly bleed. The hedge funds will, as the pressure walls become closer and the FT squeeze periods get narrower as shorts continue to be shorted and shares continue to be unavailable you know as others do that when the ftd squeeze aligns with the buying pressure walls the stones have been gathered and the real snap occurs you may have been inevitable but they we are diamond hands and that's it um i thought this report was very helpful uh there is a little bit, I, I want to be honest, there's a small bit inside of me that wonders if there are any tricks up their sleeves that they could conceive of that would drive the price lower and just cause it to end. But I just, I can't see it. Again, they either need to reshort or they need to turn in shares. And it looks to me like they're not turning in shares, that they are doubling down. I mean, to a little bit, they have turned in shares, but not nearly at the point, given the, the diamond hands, given the lack of ava available shares, they, they just, they haven't been able to unwind. I, I'm certain of that. So, you know, there will be ups and downs, there will be peaks and valleys, but if you hold strong, um, I think I am very confident that your return will be will have been worth it so keep those diamond hands